in May, and we need to kind of talk what contrasts us against each other, what's different. Um, as you know, in the Republican Party, for a long time, there's been something of a split. 76, 1980, Ronald Reagan came out. He wasn't a party insider. The party actually didn't like him that much and didn't want him. Um, George Bush Sr. was kind of the Rockefeller Northeast, um, more elite Republican crowd, and Ronald Reagan was a We the People guy. Um, of the Barry Goldwater, limited government, free markets. Um, that's, that's where I come from. I'm a, I'm a We the People guy out of the streets. Um, I believe in limited government. So my answer to most things would be to let people keep as much of their money as possible. Um, in going to Congress, I would, I would rather than ask me what I'm going to do, it's more about what I like to undo. Um, so to counteract someone handing up bags of money or small bags, I would say that uh, I would like to do a lot of repealing of taxes, of regulation, and of many of the things that we've seen this last year. And, um, and that would be my solution and answer to that. I think that um, if we want to have prosperity and growth, we have to get off the backs of small businesses and the economic engine behind this country, and that's the way to prosper and grow. Um, that, is, that is the solution. We are the solution to most of our problems, not government. Government intervention basically just gets people tied down and dependent. And we're an independent, free people and always have been, and that's where our strength lies. So I would do everything I could to make people be able to keep more of their money and compensate them that way, and be able to invest in their own families, their own businesses, and their own futures, as opposed to getting them on the government dole in any way, shape, or form. Thank you, John. John's a good candidate. Um, Thanks, Rob. For a lot of <laughs> He is. He's a great guy. Right <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Um, I think that uh, when we talk, the interesting thing about both of us is that we haven't held elected office before. So you can't judge. You can't judge us by a record that you can go traipse down and, and and find how we vote. You simply have to look into the character of both candidates. Hopefully, you find good character in both of us. That's why I say he's a good candidate. Uh, at the same time, you have to look at the principles that drive us. And I'll just talk about the, the principles that drive me, uh, because I'm running uh, to represent myself here. And that is that as a business owner for 15 years, having employed dozens of people, uh, having um, created jobs for more than 500 people around the country, in fact, even overseas, uh, I know a little bit about uh, how to work hard and how to work honestly and ethically to get results. And, uh, and I've never looked to anyone else to do that for me. I'm the only one of seven children raised here in the Portland area that finished college. And I started my business out of my back pocket with the help of my supportive and cooperative wife. And, uh, and so I don't know what it's like to be in someone else's pocket. I don't know what it's like to have to, re to have to pay back individuals who've helped me get where I want to go. So I'm running for this position because I haven't been on the trajectory to run for Congress. No one has, no one has propped me up, no one has groomed me for this position. I didn't know the people in the Republican Party, both statewide and nationally, until last summer. They didn't even know my name. And so some people ask me, why are you running for Congress? How do we know it's not going to change you? And the first thing I would say is, and these are my friends asking me this, um, who are concerned, because they see what Congress can do to good people. And, uh, and the first thing I would say is, don't judge me by the sins of other people. If I'm walking down the street on one side, and someone else is walking down the street on the other side, and they happen to walk into the store and rob it, do we count all people walking down the street as bad people? Of course we don't. I want you to judge me by me. And the best way you can do that is get to know me, as again, I said, I brought my character witness tonight. Get to know my, my, the way I run my business. Talk to my employees, talk to my clients. All of them are an open book as I am as well. And I will fight for what's right because I'm coming with principles. My principles aren't being, aren't being um, molded by somebody else. And so I have I'm very sure footing as to who I am. And by the way, I've got one person watching every move I make. She's known me for 30 years. And I think that she'll, uh, she'll always remind me, Rob, you're just Rob from Tualatin. <laughs> More questions? John? 
you know, we, we've been here, and I think we can pretty well agree on limited government. I think we can pretty well agree on the free enterprise system. But there might be some disagreement on Afghanistan and Iraq. And maybe you could address that. Either one. Both. Oh, sure. Go ahead. I'll go first. Um, I'm not a military guy, so I have great respect for the military because they know what I don't know. They've seen what I haven't seen. So I am one who firmly believes that you need to listen to the leaders on the ground. Uh, you can't fight a war from Washington, D.C. You need to fight it from, with, the, with the intelligence and the boots that are on the ground. And so I did support the, uh, the move to Iraq back in 2003. I believe that was the right thing to do for our country. Uh, did we make mistakes? Of course we did. Was it an unconventional war? Who could deny that it was? Did we have to make up rules as we went? Yes, we did. Because we were fighting, we weren't fighting a country. We were fighting a movement that was largely um, unidentified and, and moving stealthily. And so I, because of that, our country entered new terrain, so to speak. And so we made some mistakes strategically and perhaps even in the way we executed the war. I would not, I would not deny that. Uh, war is not perfect, and neither are the people that we ask to fight it. However, I do believe that when we send men and women overseas to fight for us, they need to know that while they're over there, we do not believe the war is lost, as Senator Reid said on the, on the floor of the Senate during the middle of the Iraq war. I think that was abominable for him to say such a thing, to suggest to our fighting men and women that they're over there for naught. As far as Afghanistan, um, I, do, I do agree with uh, President Obama's move uh, a couple of months ago to send 30,000 troops. Uh, I don't believe we should, we should have a timetable for withdrawal. I think that's silliness. I think what we should say is, if I was Obama, I would say July 2011, 2011 we need to see certain things happen on the ground, or July of July 2011 comes, and whichever happens last, that's our, that's our trigger to begin withdrawal. So instead of giving, instead of giving the, uh, the uh, enemy our playbook, I think we need to go there, we need to fight to win. I do not believe that the president should have taken 90 days to make that decision. As someone uh, commonly said, he made more time to say, he took more time deciding on his dog than he took you know, in, in making certain moves in our, in our uh, military operation. But 90 days was way too long. Uh, it, left our, it left our fighting men and women in the lurch. And so when you, when you put a particular general, McChrystal, in place back in April 2009, and then you don't speak to him for nearly six months, that to me is, a, is, is shepherding your leadership role to somebody else. So I think we need to show strong leadership. And so I think we should be in it to win it. I don't think it's going to be pretty, but I, I hate, I shudder to think what the consequences would be if we left Afghanistan prematurely because of the, uh, of the human toll that we'll see in a country that is, uh, that is so unregulated by itself. I'm reading a fascinating book right now about the whole, about the whole uh, war in Afghanistan, and uh, it is, again, uncharted waters, and we cannot compare it to other conflicts. That is a disservice to this war. It's got its own complexities. I don't claim to be an expert, but I do claim to be one who listens carefully to those who are. Okay. As I told you, my father's a United States Marine. Um, many of my campaign are soldiers. Uh, I sat around with a group of advisors and I, I realized that every one of them had served as they, as they went around and talked. Um, I'm diametrically opposed to most of President Obama's approach to national security. I find it endangers us on many levels. The fact that they're trying to try people in civilian uh, courts when we could have extracted information out of them um, that were not uh, racially profiling. I find most of his policies appalling. I don't like, um, I stand in, in opposition to um, the reaching out the hand of the enemy. I, I soundly believe, once again, under Ronald Reagan, for eight years, we stood tall. He built up a 600-ship navy 
And we didn't have to fight any wars. People knew the response. And many of you remember that upon taking office, the, the Iranians handed over our hostages almost immediately. Um, we had a couple small skirmishes with Libya and, and what have you. But we, when you stand tall, you speak softly and carry a big stick. Um, the apology, apologizing to our enemies, the bowing to, to people, showing weakness. I don't believe in any of this. Um, I don't support the administration in any way, shape, and form. I find that most of, their, most of what they do is political. Um, they are putting people in harm's way. And we don't need to be playing pop a mole. We know who we're fighting. All of these, all of these uh, overseas contingency operations, uh, whether it's Somalia, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, um, on and on. I mean, we all know that even even the Palestinian conflict, it, it all involves Muslim extremists that are that are they're out to get our country. They're out to hurt our country. And so I don't like playing Pablo. I don't like watching us fight with one hand tied by our under, behind our back. I don't like politicians playing politics with our soldiers' lives, the families um, that that love and support them. And I don't like anything about any of the policies I see out there currently today. I would rather us not be engaged, but I don't think that's a possibility. We are embroiled in this. I mean, we've been in Afghanistan for what, over eight years now? Um, I, I do agree that it's a different war, but all wars are. All wars are, you fight against humans, it's, you have to be adaptive, they are. Um, we need to go out there and we need to strike our enemies hard and get our guys back. And, and I'm sorry to say this, but to, if you fight, you fight with everything you have. It's about killing the other people. And General Patton said, oh, here's a little story for you about General Patton in World War II. After slapping a soldier in the, in the hospital, they took him off a of D-Day. He didn't go in. Eisenhower said, I'm sorry, you're going to be a faint. You're going to go around south. He said, you're going to use me as a decoy, seriously, the third army? And he said, yes, I'm sorry. Well, lo and behold, we Normandy invasion, we swept in. Uh, the Germans struck back with almost 200 at the Battle of the Bulge. It was a shock. They fought back. We were set to take heavy losses. They called Patton and said, General Patton, I need you to march the third army 100 miles in two days. That's the biggest march in, in uh, military history, as far as I know. He said, can you do it? I need you to hit him from the side with everything you have. And Patton said, absolutely. He marched the Third Army in two days, 100 miles, almost 50 miles a day. He hit them from the side. But before he left, he said to his soldiers, when we get there, he used some language I'm not going to use. You're going to tear the you-know-what out of them. You're going to run them over. And anyone that surrenders within 100 yards, you shoot them. You shoot them. General Patton would be, a, would be a war criminal under the rules we operate today. But that's how you fight a war. And he was a hero, and he smashed them from the side, and we took down Germany. But that's the kind of way you fight or you don't fight at all. And that's what I believe. And um, I think national security is of the utmost importance, and we must be strong. We must be economically strong, and we need to be militarily, militarily strong, or we shouldn't engage. And what we're doing now is half measures, and I don't, and I don't, I don't, I find it distasteful, and I find most of the national security policies of this current administration uh, completely opposed to me. All right, well, we got, we have 12%, 12 is Hispanic. Oh, he asked, what is my position on amnesty? Once again, Ronald Reagan took a stance on it, and, uh, and then here, you, and um, here we are again with the same problem. Uh, like with a lot of social issues, you notice that the politicians don't want to touch them. They have a spite over them, and uh, as constituents, and they don't ever solve them. Um, I believe that we. First off, I was shocked with the stimulus bill that we didn't use any of the money to uh, build a build a wall. I mean, I think we got a chain link fence down there. I know China put a wall up three thousand years ago. You can see from space, and um, we seem to be capable of securing our borders. It's not that I don't, as I said, you know, all of us, all of our ancestors or some of us in the room are, have come here from somewhere else and I don't want to stop the people from coming here. The day that happens, it's a sorry, that's a, that's a sorry state of affairs. You want this to be the beacon of freedom where people want to come to. But that said, we have multiple problems on our border, not just immigration. We have people trying to get in here, trying to harm us. We have drugs coming across the border. Um, what I would like to see is that we secure down the borders, number one, and we take an accounting and we know who's here. Um, I would also like to see that uh, employers do verify 
so that um, I think that a lot of the problem would settle itself and take care of What we've done is set up a society where we don't check where all these services are available. Well, we have no money. I mean, we're, we're broke as a nation. We're broke as a state. Um, and we're, we're, we're setting it up where people come here and take advantage. So um, to eliminate those things first, E-Verify so that employers aren't employing um, the people or they are, and then we can take a look at the situation. And obviously, I know in the agricultural industry here, we have you know many people that that need the labor, so we need some type of work program, but we need to know who's here. I mean, we need to know who's here. We can't have people walking around that we don't, we don't, who are using fake names, selling drugs to our children, um, taxing our, our um, criminal justice system and our jails, and um, sponging off our, our social services. So I would, I absolutely am opposed to amnesty. I would like to secure the borders first. I would like to verify, take an accounting, and then potentially set up a work program for legitimate workers who we know who they are here as needed. But right now, you know, we have high unemployment, so um, I don't believe that Americans won't do the jobs. I know my parents and myself when I was young did every sort of job out there. I did everything, and um, I wasn't ashamed to do it. It taught me hard work. In some cases, it taught me what I don't, what I didn't want to do, and it was motivation for me to go to school or get a better job. But. Um, I don't believe in amnesty, and I would, I would secure the borders and, as I said, take a look after that with the situation and see if that doesn't take, take care of a lot of the problem or address it. Straight out, I don't believe in amnesty. I don't support that. Um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's ironic that we live in a, in a nation that is so technologically advanced, and yet we cannot secure our borders. We can do so many other great things. So I have to wonder if it's either a question of efficiency, competency, uh, or perhaps it's just a political decision not to secure our borders. I think we all know what, what the answers are. So we need, we need principled congressmen who will go in and put pressure on the administration to do just that and to fund uh, the securing of our borders, as well as making sure that we are adhering to the laws that have already been passed. Uh, in any other aspect of our society, it seems when we pass laws, we seem to honor them. We, we acknowledge them. But when it comes to illegal immigration, we give it a pass. We, have, we are a nation of laws. We need to act like it. I'd like to just point out one thing uh, that John mentioned about the, um, about the fact that we, we need to give Americans reason to take jobs in this, in this country. Let me talk just about a, as an example I had. Someone I spoke to yesterday uh, over in Washington County, and he has a client, he's a, he's a CPA, he has a client in Eastern Oregon. This particular business in Eastern Oregon happens to be one of the largest in that state, in that region of the state. And they have 160 jobs they're trying to fill right now. They are labor jobs, good paying jobs, great wages, benefits. But you know what? They can't find people in the local communities in Eastern Oregon to take the jobs. And what they're hearing from people who are currently unemployed is, why would I take this job when right now, Oregon State Unemployment pays me well, gives me a, an incentive with a clothing allowance, an education allowance, a transportation allowance. Why would I take a risky job? And now that employer is literally having to go across the state, excuse me, across the border, and they're considering busing people in from Idaho to work in this Eastern Oregon city. That is a mentality, an entitlement mentality that must be changed. It starts with elected officials who can encourage the youth of today to recognize the principles that I believe, sir, you live by and espouse, and the kind that, that, uh, that made this state and, and people in this room successful. And as I suggested earlier in my remarks, I need to teach my boys that it's their own hard work and self-reliance that, uh, that they can always rely on and not a government agency. Um, so I think we have a lot to give here in Oregon. That's why people want to come here, even people from, uh, from other countries. We should be grateful that we live in a country that people are for, that for which people are clamoring to get into, and we should never lose sight of that fact. But we also have to recognize our sovereignty is most important, our security. For that reason, I, uh, I would strongly encourage the, uh, the policies that I earlier articulated. But thank you for your question. It's on pro life issues. Pro life issues. Oh, the candidates. 
Yes, please. I'm pro life. <laughs> Absolutely pro life, but at the same time, when I become the governor, I'm going to take the, uh, the money away for the uh, state funded abortion. Taking the life away itself is bad. Why do we have to pay by your tax dollars? You can count on them. And then accept mother's life, incest, and then uh, what was the other one? Rape. Rape, yes. Some extreme cases. But otherwise, I want you to know, as soon as I become, I already planned out what I need to do. That's one of the things I'm going to do. Thank you. All right, well, first off, like I told you before, I'm a constitutionalist. So personally, I believe Roe versus Wade was not a decision that should have been made by the federal government. It should have been left to the states and the people, respectively. Um, that said, we now have what has become a litmus test. Um, I'm taking a pro-choice stance, but to be honest with you, I am very much anti-abortion in my choice of life. The reason that I'm taking that stance is now that we are in this situation, we have stuck ourselves in a permanent minority um, and until, and we have, not that it's not a very important issue, but we have to get into government and take back government because the other side has left this issue out there as a red herring that we leech on to and we, and we stay to it. They let us have that and do that and they, they have the control of the government and until we get control back and take back our nation, I don't believe that um, we're gonna be able to uh, address those type of things properly. So what I tell people to do is live live to their values and um, stand up to them and preach them loudly. But at this point, it's very hard to dictate, um, unless I became pregnant or I'm on the Supreme Court, what to tell somebody else to do with their body. And I don't like the fact that I think that people now use it as a form of birth control. Um, I think that young women, we have a culture now that doesn't make you responsible for the consequences of your actions. Um, like I said, though, if I had my choice, I would favor a cultural life. That said, um, I do not support any federal funding of abortion. I do not uh, support late-term partial birth abortions. Um, I do support parental notification and consent, uh, but it's not a front-running issue for me because I think we have, we are, our nation is slipping and we need to um, get back the reign of government uh, so that we can address these types of things and start preaching to our convictions, our values, and our principles from there. A quick uh, question for Mr. Lim. Um, I know I'm disappointed, but how disappointed are you that you uh, cannot run for the president? I raised three children and four grandkids. We were born in Korea, my first son born in Korea, and uh, another daughter I adopted from Korea. Only son born in here, he is only qualified to run for the governor. <laughs> Not for, the, for, the, for the president. Okay, he is only for, he's a natural born American citizen. He is the only one who possibly run for president. <laughs> and I, don't worry, we have fun with Sarah Palin. <laughs> Okay, um, one more announcement. Our next meeting will be February 16th, regularly scheduled day, Tuesday at Dugers, back to Dugers again. And I, again, I want to thank Krista, I don't know if she's still here somewhere, for letting us use the serendipity and. Uh